Uh, my name is Dave Nelson, and I am President and CEO of Integrity. Uh, we're an information security consulting firm based here in Des Moines. We've also got office in Kansas City and one in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I'm also a fellow with the Information Systems Security Association and the chapter president for the ISSA here in Des Moines. Um, we do broadcast those uh, meetings, those monthly meetings, out over the web. Um, and so if you're anywhere in the state and you'd like to join us, um, please see me afterwards. I'd be happy to, uh, to get you more information about the, uh, the ISSA chapter. We're going to be talking a little bit today about um, social engineering and how that's kind of changing, um, why we as security professionals need to be fully understanding how social engineering is being used against our organizations, um, give you a little bit of an idea of what a full-scale attack would look like, uh, and then I'll answer any questions that you might have. Um, we can go from there. So, uh, first off, uh, we're going to talk a little bit just about what social engineering is. I'll give you some real-world examples of some of the things that we've done and some of the testing that we've uh, uh, done for clients, uh, and then talk about some of the best defense uh, principles for how to work through uh, social engineering attacks with your organizations. So, first off, when you think about social engineering, <clears throat> what's one of the things that comes to mind? Anybody? Fishing. Yeah. Fishing. Physical. What's that? Physical. Physical entry. People. What's that? People. People? Yeah. So, yeah. So the idea here is, you know, we haven't talked anything really about computers, about technology. Mostly it's been about people, and that's what this exactly is about. Right? Anybody seen in the movie Rounders way back in the 90s? Okay, I'm getting really old then. <clears throat> uh, it's a good movie. Matt Damon is, uh, is one of his uh, earlier movies, okay? And he's talking about, there's a scene in there where he's going in to play high stakes poker. Uh, and he's kind of the newbie in this area. And so as he's walking through, there's a little narration. He's narrating um, uh, about his experience. And one of the things that he says is that the game of poker is not about playing the cards but playing the man, okay? And that's exactly what social engineering is. We're not worrying about the technology. Certainly technology will be an enabler. It'll be a part of it, and it's the ultimate end game is to win the game of technology. But we're gonna be playing the man or the woman in front of that technology to try and get access to it. So that's a little bit about what we're gonna uh, start with is, is how this actually happens. <clears throat> So if you know anything, if anybody's taken any colleges for psychology, social engineer, or, uh, psychology, sociology, anything like that, you'll know that we have this huge study of behavior, okay, human behavior. And it's been going on for thousands of years, okay? One of the things that we're trying to do is understand how people respond in different situations and then place them in those situations to elicit a specific type of response, okay? So what I'm trying to do is quite simply, I'm trying to put you in a situation where I can manipulate you. As a social engineer, okay, as a hacker using social engineering techniques, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to play on your humanity. I'm gonna try and use your humanity against you because by nature, we wanna be communicative with other people. We want to talk with other people. We wanna be social humans, okay? That's who we are by our nature. And so it's the hacker using that against us. Okay? So we use psychology and sociology. Okay? We talk about what is a learned behavior, what's a known behavior, uh, what's a natural response. Okay? We're looking at the norms of society. Okay? How are you expected to react in a group of, of people at work versus how would we expect you to react in a group of people that you're friends versus the group of people that you're family. Okay? Each one of those, if we put you in a same situation with different group of people, how will you react? Will you react differently? Will you react the same? Okay? So it's the study of, of what's happening. We've been doing this for years and years and years. Okay? The bad guys use this same exact information that we use for research, to help people, to uh, plan for marketing and communications. The bad guys are doing, doing the exact same thing. Okay? What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to predict your reactions, okay? Because if I can predict your reactions, I can craft a scenario that will elicit a specific response based on what I can estimate your reaction will be, okay? <clears throat> So I have two types of responses, okay? Basic types of responses, my natural response and my learned response. Anybody here have small children? At some point in your life, have you had small children? Okay, so everybody, 
at least has been a small child at some point, right? Okay, great. Do we have any small children with us today? Hey, all right, we got a couple of you. All right, think about a two-year-old, okay? Typical response of a two-year-old when they don't get something that they want is to throw a complete and utter temper tantrum, right? That is their natural behavior, their natural response. You don't have to teach a two-year-old to throw a temper tantrum. They know how to do that from day one, okay? Your learned response, however, is through coaching of your parents, through teachers, through all of your you know, grade school and high school and college and then work, through people that you interact with. It's the fact that you can't throw a temper tantrum when you don't get your way. So that's your learned response. So as a hacker, okay, when I'm gonna employ social engineering, I'm gonna try and play on one of those two responses, either what I believe your natural response will be or what I believe your learned response will be. Anybody's company here have the logo or the motto or the phrase, the customer's always right? Yeah, okay, to some degree. Okay. I, as a hacker, know that, and I know that if I get irate enough with you on the phone, you're eventually gonna pass me off to somebody with a higher clearance to deal with me. And that will continue to happen until somebody understands that I'm a really unhappy customer and I want some answers, okay? So I know that, I know that that's the learned response because you know that your company wants to please me. Even though I'm not really a customer, you may think that I'm a customer and you wanna please me. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create these situations where I can place you in the situation that I want so I can play on your emotion, so I can play on your natural response, your learned response, whatever it happens to be. Okay? So why are we talking about this? Uh, according to the 2013, which I know is a, a year old now, uh, Verizon Data Breach Response Report, <clears throat> if you look at the first three, okay, these are some of the attack methods that were used. Hacking, weak, or, weak or stolen passwords, uh, and then 40% incorporated some sort of malware. Okay? Each of those were on a downward trend during that year. Okay? The last two there, physical attacks and social tactics, were on the increase. So what's happening is we're getting much better at protecting our infrastructure, our applications. We're getting better at secure coding, at keeping things patched. And so those typical technical exploits aren't working as well as they used to. So the hackers have to find some other method to get in. And the easiest target is our people, us. Okay? That's why we're talking about this. That's why this is important. So what are some of the common types of attacks? We're going to go through these five, dumpster diving, pretexting, or basically fake phone calls. They're, they're real phone calls, just the purpose is fake. Uh, phishing, uh, physical presence, and then emanations, or things that you can leave around and let people get, okay? Uh, enticement, I'm sorry, enticement. <clears throat> so the first one, dumpster diving. If we go in and do a full-blown social engineering attack against an organization, there's usually a couple of weeks worth of uh, uh, reconnaissance that we do. Okay? We go and we just sit out in the parking lot and we observe the people. We look at traffic patterns. We look at when people are coming and going. Do they come together? Do they go to lunch together? Uh, you know, what are they doing? Uh, we look at when is their trash pickup? Uh, we look at how do they do their shredding? Is somebody come out and watch the guy do the shredding? Does the shredding guy leave a bunch of buckets outside and then go in and get more and come back out? We, we watch all of these things and we're looking, okay? One of the very first things that we do is dumpster diving. Anybody feel like that was their career goal of choice? No, I'm the only one? Something is very wrong with me. Okay, uh, dumpster diving tells us a ton, right? Okay? There's a couple of different things here when you look at this, okay? I can go in and I can try and get information from you, but I have to deal with you. Nothing against any of you, I'm sure you're all nice people, but I don't want to deal with you. Okay? I'd prefer to just have that information provided to me. And that's what the dumpster dive does. Okay? I find all sorts of great information when I go in and I start looking for source code. I start looking for, um, believe it or not, we do find source code in the trash and not in the um, uh, uh, shred bins. Uh, I look for day planners, I look for uh, vacation lists, I look for all sorts of stuff. Okay? Let me give you a great example of what I'm gonna do here, okay? If I'm gonna set up a, 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 an individual or a company for a social engineering attack here, I'm gonna go in 
And one of the very first things I'm going to look for is a sheet that's, pasted, that, that's typically posted outside of a conference room that has all of the days conference, you know, or all of the days meetings listed, who's involved, if there's a bridge line with an access code, okay, all of that stuff is usually on that sheet, and a lot of times people just go by, or the janitor at the end of the day just picks it up, throws it in the trash, and somebody puts a new one out in the morning. Okay? That's one of the very first things I'm going to look for. One of the other things I'm going to look for is a calendar for individuals. Okay? Believe it or not, there's still a ton of people that use paper calendars. They print them out, they put them in their little binders, and they walk around and they write handwritten notes. Happens all the time. And all of those just get ripped up. And a lot of times not ripped up, just ripped out and thrown in the trash. Okay? Here's why that is so important. Okay? As a social engineer, I'm looking for any excuse I can to be in your organization. To be on a phone call, to be physically present, to be, have you call me, for me to call you. Okay? If I'm looking and I see a bridge line, okay, I'm going to dial in. And I'm going to use the passcode. And I'm going to have access to whatever phone call that is, and I'm going to listen to see if this is something good. And I'm going to start taking notes. Who's in attendance? Who's paying attention? Who's not in attendance? Where are these people located? What's the topic? Is this a, a good discussion? Is this a not so good discussion? Because then I'm going to start looking at that information and say, how can I use that to further my goals later on? Okay. So this dumpster diving idea is something where I initially get my first ideas for how I'm going to further attack your organization. Because if I don't know anybody there, maybe I know some names, maybe I know uh, some titles, or, or I know projects that are being worked on. And if you're being targeted, I certainly will know some of that. But that might not be enough to get me in the door. Okay? So that very first part of that is the dumpster diving where I try and go get some of that information, which most of you do not consider confidential. Okay? A conference bridge line with the passcode in most organizations is not considered confidential. The conversations in those bridge lines, very confidential. Right? So now all of a sudden you've just given out all of the information I need to sit in on a verbal conference. Anybody ever join one of those bridge lines and had somebody say, hey, who joined, and complete silence? Yeah, that was me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, that was somebody else in our office. It wasn't me. Uh, so that's really important. Okay? If you're running conference bridge lines, make sure that you sound or that you ask who's there. Have some sort of mechanism to find out who's dialing in. Okay? So after I get this information from the dumpster dive, I now have names of people that were involved. I know the project. I know who was listening and who wasn't listening. I know what the deliverables were. Somebody was asking for something to be done by the end of the day or by next week, or somebody was asking for something else. <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call you and pretend to be somebody from your company or somebody that's a consultant or somebody that's involved in this project. Okay? And with this, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to immediately try and extract additional information from you, or I'm going to set you up for a fall later on. Okay? The important part here is that if I come out right away and ask for information that's confidential or that sounds weird and you don't know me, what's going to happen? Suspicion. Red flags, right? Little alarm bells. Burr, burr, burr. Hey, I don't know who this individual is, and they just asked me for the keys to the kingdom. They're going to start to shut down. Okay? So if I'm doing this right, most of the time, I'm not going to ask you for information the first time. I'm going to prime you. I'm going to say, I'm here to help you. Hey, I, I heard you know, Bob was on this phone call earlier today, and you were struggling with this, this, and this. And he asked me to give you a call and see if you needed any help, or uh, can I get some data to you? you know, OK, that's great. Can you tell me, give me the file names that you need? And I'll, get, you know, I'll pull all of that data together, and I'll push it you know, back out to you. OK, well, great. I just got a couple of file names. <laughs> now I start to know what I'm looking for. right? So once I do get technical access, I now have narrowed my search. I don't have to do this big, huge shotgun approach. I'm a very needle, precision, you know, surgical attack. Right? So if I ask you for help right away, or ask you for information right away, you may start to freak out a little bit and say, hmm, hold on, I don't know about this guy. But if I step back and say, let me help you, Oh yeah, you're all about help. Okay? 
if I call and say, hey, I'm from tech support, and I understand you've had a couple of computer issues over the last couple of weeks, and you know, we want to get this taken care of for you, um, I'm not going to be able to get up there today, but will you be around tomorrow? Oh, you've got meetings, which I already know you have meetings all day because I have your day planner right here. Okay. Oh, okay, well, how about, I tell you what, I'll meet you at your desk at, at 9.30 before your meeting. You get me logged in, and I will take care of this for you. Right? Oh, okay, great. You're going to help me. Hey, perfect. You didn't ask me for anything today. And if you're going to physically be in my building, well, you must be approved, right? Everybody shaking your head? Yes, if I'm physically in a building, I must be authorized to be there because we all know that that's true. Nobody ever gets into a facility that they shouldn't be in, right? Okay. Then what I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to follow up probably with some sort of email confirmation. Hey, Sue. Great talking to you, meeting you on the phone today. Just want to confirm that I will be at your desk at 9.30 tomorrow to take care of this you know, computer issue for you. Uh, please send back and validate, or please click here to you know, rate my uh, you know, responsiveness to you. Blah, 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 blah. So now you're going to respond back to me, or you're going to click this link, and bam, now all of a sudden, if I've crafted that well enough, I've evaded some of your uh, antivirus tools, I've evaded some of your uh, anti-spam and anti-phishing, I may have just run some sort of executable on that machine. So now I don't even care if you're there or not <clears throat> because I've already got access. But if that doesn't work, maybe I'm going to try something else. Maybe I'll send you a different email and say, hey, um, I need you to update you know, what your, your information is about you know, this particular um, uh, concern or your computer issue. So provide this information to me, and I give you another link trying to get you to click on something else, right? Or I ask you for your computer name, or I ask you for your IP address, right? Because I'm trying to help you, you want to give me that information. I've placed you in a situation that I know your initial response to me is going to be, oh, thank you for the help. Sure, I'll give you information if you can help me. I, you're not trying to take advantage of me, you're trying to help me, right? And I might do this to two or three or four different people within the organization who are all on that same phone call. I know they're all going to be in the same meeting. And I tell one of them, I'll meet you there at 9.30, and then the other one I, I'll call right before then and say, hey, I got tied up. Um, can you just uh, you know, leave it logged in? I'm, I'm going to be there in just two or three minutes. You know, just leave it logged in. Or you know, write your username and password down right there on, on a sticky note, and I'll be there. I'll get it logged in. I'll get your profile fixed, and everything will be good. Okay? If you don't believe these things happen, I've got tons of reports and proof to show you. Okay? That's all it takes because somebody's already in the building. Okay? I'm not asking you to send it to me. I'm not asking you to give it to me over the phone. I'm going to come to your desk and get it. And you're okay with that. Right? So I've set up all of this stuff through phishing. Okay? I can use sweet deals and help me help you. And if you're my brother, who's two years younger than I am, you got to see this. The man cannot refuse a joke from anybody on the face of this planet. If somebody sends him something, thinks that it's funny, he's going to click on it. Okay? He is not in technology. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> All right. Uh, the hidden URLs, right? I've got sweetdeal.com, but it really, it, that's pointing to I will rob you blind.com, right? All of these types of things. I mean, most of us know these things, right? But there's going to be people out on the web watching this, so we want them to understand what's happening. Okay? Um, checking the, uh, the address bar. right? If you look up there, you've got, uh, you probably can't see it, www.google. Oh, I stopped reading. Once I hit Google dot, OK, that must have been good. But you didn't finish reading the baddomain.com. Uh-oh. Well, it looks like Google. It's Google's homepage, and it says Google up front. Is that Google or not? Okay. <clears throat> uh, these tiny URLs. I, I want every one of you to go into work on Monday, walk into your marketing department, find somebody, and slap them. <laughs> Seriously. Marketing departments are horrible about using these stupid tiny URLs in internal documents and external documents and everything else. From us, this is kind of like playing Russian roulette, right? Hey, I'm just going to you know, spin the revolver and pfft, who knows where it's going to take me, right? I'm opening this door, and I could be walking off the edge of a cliff. We have no idea where these things are going. Okay? So if I'm trying to fish you, these are all of the things that I'm going to do. I may put them all in one document. And if I craft it well enough, if I do things right, and this is a spear phishing attack, 
your anti-spam and anti-phishing is not going to catch this. Okay? It's getting harder and harder to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of skill to craft it. But if I have the time and the skill, it's not a problem. Okay? Uh, so Google is not Goggle. Google.com is not Goggle.com. Your eyes played a little trick on you there, didn't it? Because you saw Google first, and you're used to seeing Google, and then you didn't see Goggle. Right? <clears throat> That's how I'm going to get you. Okay? I'm going to send you to some link. I'm going to send you to something. And if you're not an experienced user, you're going to click on this day in and day out. With our phishing campaigns, we usually get about 50% success rate of clicking on the link. And after that, it's usually somewhere between 30 and 50% of that 50% will get some sort of user credentials or something where they're signing up or using their Active Directory password uh, to sync up with their new health insurance plan or whatever it happens to be. Okay? So this stuff happens. It happens all the time. So I've used dumpster diving to get information. Then I've used that information to make some pretexting phone calls and to set up some physical or set up some uh, uh, phishing campaigns or some uh, spear phishing campaigns. And now I'm going to go back to the actual physical entry. I'm going to come in and I'm going to be at your desk at 9:30. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to walk in. Because I've already been watching the patterns, right? We did about a week's worth of watching who's going, what's happening, where are they at, okay? And then I take it to the next level. And I know that everybody pretty much comes in around 8 o'clock, 10 till, 10 after, okay? And I know that they usually all kind of walk together in packs, and everybody, oh, one guy badges in and everybody else holds the door, okay? And they never say boo to each other. They just look at each other, kind of look for a badge, and then let everybody walk in. And I already know this is your behavior. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in with a computer bag over my shoulder, a badge that looks like yours on my hip, and two bags of bagels from Panera or whatever the you know, fancy place is. And I'm going to be like trying to get up to the badge reader. And it doesn't quite get up there. So somebody else is going to you know, badge me in because hopefully we're going to become real good buds and you're going to come get a bagel. <clears throat> and that's exactly what happens. And not only do you badge me in the first door, you badge me in whatever door I stop at and help me get in. And then I set down the bagels. I'm like, oh, dude, thanks. I just started here you know, a week this, you know, earlier this week on Monday. I'm working for Bob upstairs or whoever it is because I know because I've already got all of the user lists. I already know who was on the phone calls. I was brought in specifically to work on this project, which everybody in the company knows because it's a big, huge project. right? And so you absolutely, I, there's no way an outsider could know all that information. You trust me. So I start setting all this stuff up. I say, hey, I'll be right back. Go ahead and set stuff up, grab a donut, or you know, grab a, a bagel or a donut, uh, and I'll be right back. And then I keep you busy doing your stuff, and I'm gone. I'm anywhere within your company that I want to be. Now, from a legal perspective, any attorneys or cops in here? OK. I'm going to give you a little tip here. I have yet to do anything wrong. I have yet to break any laws. Okay? And here's why. I didn't force you to let me in. You invited me in. Okay? You held the door for me. I did not force my way in. I did not come in and use any sort of false pretense and tell you I was somebody you know, from, a, a, um, uh, you know, from a, a government agency or anything like that. Okay? I could even walk up to the front door dressed in blue um, uh, uh, work pants and a blue shirt, blue t-shirt that says fire across it with a radio strapped to my shoulder, squawking, and say, hey, yeah, ho uh, sorry, hold on just a second. Yeah, okay, uh, sorry, I need to see your, uh, I just need to see your, your uh, sprinkler, or your, yeah, your sprinkler box and your uh, fire extinguishers and, you know, then I can do my check and it'll be, you know, right out of your hair. Oh, okay, you must be from the fire department. Sure, if that's what you think. <laughs> right? I've never said that I represent a fire department. I've never said that I am a government official. I've never claimed to be something that I'm not. You made the assumption and invited me into your organization. So at that point, the worst you can do is call the police and say that I'm trespassing after you discover I'm not who I say I am and ask me to leave. And if I leave, I still haven't done anything wrong. Right? You could probably still get me for a trespassing charge. I'll be, you know, 
honest with you, the cops probably aren't going to press that unless you really press it hard and there's something that you can prove that I was doing something really nefarious. Okay? So the risk to me is very, very small. Now, some of this depends on where I'm found in your organization, what's happening. Obviously, if I do this at a bank and I end up in a data center or in a vault, which has happened, uh, things get a little bit more dicey. Okay? I have to talk my way out of a few more things, uh, but I still probably have not done anything wrong as long as I have not broken into it. If I've been escorted in, there's nothing really you can do to me except tell me to leave. And as long as I leave peacefully, I still probably am not going to get charged with anything. Okay? Now, the police may do some follow-up and they may check up on me and I may be in hot water with them for a while for you know, uh, trying to, to get into places I shouldn't be in. But at that point, I still haven't done anything that I can have a, like a, a felony you know, charge against me. Okay? So I'm still pretty safe. Now, let me think about, let's think about this one step further. I'm a U.S. citizen. What if you're not a U.S. citizen? What happens? Are you subject to the laws of the United States? I have some people shaking their head, a lot of people just staring at me like deer in the headlight. Okay? Is there ever a time when there could be somebody on U.S. soil that is not necessarily subject to U.S. law? Hmm? Diplomats. Diplomats, okay? Diplomats are subject to U.S. law to the extent that their embassy or their home country is willing to hold them captive here and make them face penalty. Okay? But as soon as they invoke that diplomatic immunity and say, no, we're just going to you know, push them out of the country, you know, pull, pull them out of the country or the U.S. is going to eject them, then all bets are off. So think about this. If I'm a foreign, uh, a foreign government and I'm the one involved in this social engineering attack, the stakes are even less for me, right? Because if I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm worried about, hey, my, my face being caught on camera, having to spend the night in the pokey, uh, having some sort of you know, charge leveled against me, uh, being tased, being shot. I mean, I have some real physical risk there, okay? But if I'm a foreign national, some of my risk is mitigated, especially if I'm there doing what I'm doing at the behest of my home country. The worst thing that's going to happen to me is they're going to pull my diplomatic immunity, or the U.S. will pull my diplomatic immunity and eject me from the country, and I'll go home and be a hero, and they'll send somebody in my place in 24 to 48 hours. Right? And this is happening. Okay? This is happening on a pretty regular basis at this point. The funny thing is, is we're doing the exact same thing in other countries. Okay? So this isn't just, hey, happening to us. It's happening across the globe. Okay? So the last thing that I'm going to do is after I'm on site, okay, I'm going to do a couple of different things. I'm going to take little duckies, little USBs, little hacking tools. I'm going to plug those into a printer, to a multifunction device. I'll plug it into any computer that I can find and try and get an IP address and then just start, you know, let, let the fun begin. Okay? Or I'm going to take a file folder that I brought in with me and I'm going to put a sheet of paper in there that says uh, 2015 layoffs or 2015 promotions and bonus schedule or whatever it happens to be and I'm going to stick a CD in it or a USB I'm going to tape it to that. How many of your employees are probably going to plug that in somewhere? All of them. Mm -hmm. All of them? Yeah. Okay. Do I care if they plug it in at your office where you know, you've got USB controls and great antivirus and anti-spam? Do I care? No, not really. That'd be my preference. But how many of your employees have remote access, VPN access? How many of them can check their email on their home computers? Okay. Bam, there you go. I just pulled keystrokes. Okay, I've got usernames and passwords, I've got entire emails, I've got control of their machine, whatever it happens to be. So I don't care if they pick it up and take it home, I don't care if they pick it up and plug it in at work, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to get information. Okay? So even after I've been there, I'm still getting information back to me. Okay? They've got these great devices that looks like a, um, looks like a little uninterruptible power supply, okay? but it's actually a little hacking box. Okay. It's got a 4G LTE connection to it, 
uh, I've got a, a you know, wireless connection, I've got an RJ45 connection, and I can put it under any desk anywhere, and nobody's gonna think twice about it because it looks like a basic little UPS that anybody would look at and say, huh, I wonder why we had a UPS there. I don't know. <clears throat> looks kind of old. All right, well, I'm sure somebody will get it. And now I have a remote machine back in your office doing whatever it is that I want to do. I have not had to penetrate your external network. I haven't had to worry about evading firewalls and IDS and IPS. I came in from the inside. Right? One time we were sitting there in the executive suite. Okay? We went in, we knocked the little you know, sign to, uh, to in use on the conference room, shut the door, and sat in there and hacked the organization for several hours before anybody came in. And then that individual came in and we're like, hey, hey, what's going on? We're right in the middle of this. And she's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And shut the door and walked away. <laughs> if you act like you're supposed to be there, okay, everybody else believes it. You're not gonna see me hiding around in the corner in a little hoodie. Oh gosh, I hope they don't see me. Okay? I'm gonna come right in, I'm gonna come right to your face, I'm gonna shake your hand. I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm gonna tell you what my new job is and who I'm working for. I wanna get you talking, I wanna get you trusting me. This whole premise is I need you to trust me. Okay? Once I get your trust, all bets are off. And I can get you to trust me, which means you can get somebody else to trust me, which means they can get somebody else to trust me, which means I haven't had to do the hard work. I only had to do it once, and now you go introduce me to all your friends. Because I asked you, hey, who do you guys work with? What do you guys do down here? Oh, cool. I'm just trying to learn more about the company. I want to you know, do my best. Okay? That's how this works. <clears throat> so when you put it all together, okay, when you look at this at big picture, you may say, Dave, this seems really crazy. Three years ago, four years ago, I would have said, you're right, this is a little bit far-fetched. Today, this is exactly how it happens. Right now, my company is working on four breach investigations. Two of them, to, to what we can tell now, followed almost this exact process. We're not sure about the dumpster diving, we can't pull, you know, prove they pulled anything there, but we're pretty sure somebody was on a conference call that they weren't supposed to be on. We're pretty sure that there was some malware introduced. We're pretty sure somebody was physically on site at at least one of them. Okay. So now all of a sudden you're looking at things saying, hey, what's happening? How is this changing? How is our world changing? We used to only have to worry about these folks in cyberspace. Right? Now all of a sudden I have to worry about them coming in my front door. How am I going to stop that? I don't have a technology to stop that. I don't have a way to put a technology thing in place over here that's going to stop people from being people. It, that doesn't work that way. Okay? As soon as you take the humanity out of it, what do we have? Right? So at this point, what we really have to focus on is training our users, getting them to understand this is what's happening. This is the way that these things occur. Changing behavior, changing the way that we think about what should go in a shred bin and what should go in the garbage. Quite frankly, if a piece of paper has anything printed or written on it, it needs to go in the shred bin. Because a guy like me can take what seems to be nothing, such as information about what meetings were in a conference room, and turn that into something pretty powerful. Maybe that in and of itself, I don't have something you know, there, but if I can use that information to continually to build and build and build, now all of a sudden I've got a ton of information and you've freely given it to me. Okay? So we have to change that behavior. We have to change the behavior of telling people to be nice to everyone. Okay? Hey, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you you're in the building, I see a badge, but it doesn't look exactly like mine, or I don't see a badge, can I see your badge? Anybody here like confrontation? Oh, come on. There's at least usually one or two or three people in a room this size that, that, that don't mind it. That's like, yeah, okay, I'll, you know, I like to argue a little bit now and then. Really? None of you? Oh, yeah, that level. <laughs> <laughs> like, alterations are not offense every now and then. <laughs> okay. You all know somebody in your, in your group of friends or, or group of work peers who doesn't shy away from the meeting where some really you know, tough things need to be said. 
right? There's, a, there's always somebody on your floor. There's always somebody that you know that you're like, man, if somebody's got to say the nasty stuff, it's, it's Dave over here. You know, if somebody's got to be the mean guy, Dave. Dave's perfect for that. He's got no problems being the mean guy, right? So even though you may not want to be the person that goes up and stops somebody and says, hey, who are you? I don't see a badge, okay? Go find somebody. Dave, Dave, there's a guy over here that I don't recognize. You should go talk to him. Wouldn't that be great? Sweet. How you doing? I'm Dave, right? Guy like me, I don't care. Hey, if I think somebody's not supposed to be there, I'll go ask them. If I get tased, yeah, so be it. Okay? But the idea here is you don't necessarily have to be the one to do something and take action, but you need, do need to be the person who reports it to somebody who can or is willing to take action. And that's what we have to get our users to understand. They don't have to be mean. Okay? You don't have to completely change the culture of our organization and make you afraid of everybody. But we do need to be a little bit more inquisitive. We do need to stop and use some common sense and say, huh, I've been told a million times not to write my password down, but the tech support guy just told me to write my password down and leave it and he'll be here in a few minutes. That doesn't seem right. What do I need to do about that? Right? That's what we have to do. We have to change the perceptions. We have to change the behavior of our users. We have to get them to begin to question things, begin to get them to understand what's happening. Okay? Here's the important part. Most of this is going to occur with no indication to you. Okay? If I'm in the middle of a social engineering campaign, if, especially if I'm planning it out well, you're not going to have any clue that it's happening. Each of these pieces are going to be done so inconspicuously. Each of these pieces are going to be done to independent individuals. They're not going to seem coordinated to an outside person. Okay? You're not going to see it happening. And so that's why detection of these things is so important. Detecting people that aren't supposed to be excuse me, in your organization. Detecting spear phishing emails. Detecting rogue uh, devices on the network. Detecting um, you know, people that, aren't, uh, that are on a conference call that aren't supposed to be there. Okay? Using something like a, a WebEx or something like that where you can actually list out and see how many people are on. Or using you know, a, a conference operator to say, give me a total of the number of people that are dialed in here. Right? <clears throat> Doing something like that. Okay? So when you think about this, social engineering is really nothing more than a long con. Right? I'm just a con man. That's all I am. I'm trying to get you to trust me. I'm trying to get you to do something that benefits me that does not necessarily benefit you. Don't fall for it. Train your people. Get them understanding what this looks like. And that this is a very, very, very real threat that is happening day in and day out. This isn't stuff for the movies anymore. So what are some of your best defenses? Like I said, there's no technology that you can use to get by with this or, or, or to fix this. Right? This has to be a mixture of different things. Process, people, technology. Right? Stronger shredding procedures. Like I said, anything that's printed or written on needs to be shredded. Limiting the facility ingress and egress points. Okay? Don't allow employees to go in every single entrance. Force them all in one entrance where there's somebody there that's at least kind of looking for familiar faces. Okay? Looking at things and saying, huh, I have not seen that individual before. Stop them. Ask them, can I get a badge? Okay? Something like that. <clears throat> uh, challenging those unknown people. Like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be you. It needs to be somebody. Uh, provide recurring and relevant employee training. Okay. We're all technology people. How many, of this, how, how many of you would say some of the stuff you heard today was new to you? Or at least a little different? Right? A few of you? Okay. Now imagine if you weren't technology people and you hadn't been exposed to this. Okay. You didn't even know this stuff was happening. We have, to, we have to tell our employees. We can't expect them to, to behave in a way that we've never trained them. We can't expect them to be able to detect a threat when we've never explained to them what that threat looks like. Okay? One of the best defenses is going to be going through an exercise with your employees and train them on how to spot these things and how to deal with it once they do find something that's suspicious. Okay? And then obviously implement all of the, the technical controls that we normally would implement. 
email filtering, you know, firewalls, two-factor authentication, you know, all of those types of things. Uh, that's your last defense, honestly. And you hope that that, that catches 90% of the stuff. It's the 10% of the stuff that it doesn't catch that's probably going to hurt the worst, right? <clears throat> And then the last one is program validation. If you've never done some sort of you know, phishing email campaign against your own organization, or you've never done uh, pretexting phone calls against your own organization, you've never done a full scale you know, uh, social engineering attack, you need to have it done or do it yourself. Okay? How many people have like a call center or a customer service group within their organization? Okay? You guys should be doing this a ton. You guys, I mean, with the turnover that we have in call centers, there should be somebody constantly calling a call center trying to elicit information about either the company or about the, your clients or whatever it happens to be. Okay? That's one of the biggest areas where we see this problem is these people are not trained. They get some training about what they can and can't give out, but it's very scripted. And if I give them a question that's not on that script, watch out. Right? If I'm not asking for an account number, I'm not asking for you know, a, a diagnosis. I'm not asking for something specific that's on this list of, you know, hey, you never ever give this stuff out. Mm, oh, okay, well, it's not on this list. It must be okay to give out. And that's what's happening. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, in your experience, can you talk about a time where you either got caught or failed and what was it that you did wrong or the client did right? Sure, yep. Um, so we've never been, well, I shouldn't say we've never been caught. Uh, usually if we're caught, it's because we're you know, lingering around in a company like all day long, you know, and, and you get careless as you go on. Like, uh, so one time I was standing in the, um, it's kind of a little break area, and uh, the director of risk management happened to walk in to get a cup of coffee, and I was standing there getting a glass of water, because by this time I'm parched and I need something to drink. Uh, and he just looks at me and says, um, what are you doing in my building? I said, exactly what you paid me to do. He's like, well, how long have you been there? I don't know, about three and a half hours now. Crap. He just turns around and walks away. Um, <laughs> so I guess I was getting caught because at that point, you know, he starts telling everybody else that I'm there, and the you know, word you know, starts getting around, and the other people that are in the building start getting caught, and you know, people start looking. Uh, one of the other times where the, the company did really well, uh, there was a bank uh, down in Fort Lauderdale uh, that we were doing this for. It's a large bank uh, down in Florida. And uh, we were at one, not their data center, but one of their uh, processing centers, which is actually in a larger office complex. There's a, bran a branch downstairs, and then there's a couple of floors. And uh, you, know, I, you don't always have the floor plans and, and these things. So I go upstairs, and I started walking down this hallway and realized, crap, it's a dead end, and the stair door on that end is locked, which it should never be locked, fire marshal, right? <laughs> uh, but the doors to that staircase were locked, uh, and there were some people coming and going from like the HR area, and so I'm trying to just look non-conspicuous, you know, staying there with my tablet like I'm waiting for a meeting or something, but uh, there's a cash office right across the hall and the HR office here, and there probably really shouldn't ever be anybody standing across from a cash office at a bank. <laughs> uh, so I got some really strange phone call, or I mean, some, some really strange looks. I made a beeline for the elevator because I was pretty sure that they were calling the cops because there was a lady coming, came back out. She was on her phone kind of describing what she was seeing. Um, and so I had to really quick call the, the VP of this bank and say, hey, make sure that if they're calling the cops, don't call the cops. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot of the people, uh, but I don't know any of the FBI agents here in Florida, and I really don't want to go to a detention center tonight. I'd rather spend the night at my hotel. <laughs> Uh, so that one they did really good. They had trained their people well. Um, they had made a choke point at that cash uh, office where they knew that if you came in, there was only one way to get back out. So they had good ingress and egress control. Um, and uh, they just had good policies for how quickly to, uh, to report an incident and go through it. So. so is that something you would, in the future, try to get more intel on or something? That, I mean, would you have done something differently having learned that lesson? Yes and no. I mean, the, you know, the reality is, is <clears throat> There's always going to be different levels of, of what we can and can't get at a specific you know, organization. Um, and if I'm a hacker, it's the same thing. You know, at some point, I just have to say, hey, I've got enough intel. I, I've got to, I have to make this, a, you know, this is my one shot. right? Um, that same bank had other issues where you know, we were able to get in, so it's not like you know, they were completely OK. Uh, it's just that particular avenue. And that, that probably isn't one that I would have picked to get into, knowing how well a cash vault you know, is, is going to be protected. Um, that's probably not an area that I'm going to try and get into if I'm not trying to steal the cash. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's probably, you know, they, that was a scenario that they wanted. It's not one that I would have necessarily picked for them, um, but we did it because that's what they wanted. Okay, and one more follow-up question. Yeah. Okay. How, how, can you kind of quantify how much like intelligence you need before you feel comfortable? Like as someone that doesn't know, how would I know when I've got enough information? Yep. Um, I would say it, it depends on, on what, your, what your end goal is, right? If your end goal is just to get physical access, um, you could get enough information just by watching ingress and egress. One building we went into, we watched and people would go in and out a door and the door would open and then it would close about like this fast. And people would just walk in and, and let it go. And so I knew all I had to do was wait long enough, you know, I'd, I'd start like 20 steps behind somebody, I'd have plenty of time to get in there and they'd never even know because they'd already be going up the stairs. Um, <clears throat> if it's, you know, if my goal is actually to get access to a system, then obviously I've got to try and continue to go until I believe that I've got somebody that's going to give me that access or you know, some sort of credentials or that I've got the ability to get physical entry and I can plug in a device that I can use to then start doing some of my you know, fun stuff. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. As, uh, going back to your first story, so when you go on an audit or any sort of you know, formal engagement like that, do you obviously you have your safe net set up just so you don't spend a night in jail or? Yeah, so, so we always have to carry our statement of work that's got the signed you know, scope and everything like that. But ultimately, uh, you know, especially in a larger organization where that individual may not be readily available and there could be you know, police on site or something of that nature, it is always up to the arresting officer whether he wants to deal with this or not, okay? Mm -hmm. Completely. So the arresting officer gets to decide whether he wants to hear you out, whether he wants to read your documentation, whether he wants to make a phone call to the executive or the VP or whoever. If he doesn't want to deal with it, then you get arrested and you go to the pokey. So I've never had that happen. None of our team has ever had that happen, but we always plan for the fact that those things could occur. We also put into our statement of work that if that does occur, the client is responsible for all of the costs incurred with getting us back <laughs> out. <laughs> so, other questions? You, you see this gray and balding head here? <clears throat> no, I, I, don't, uh, I don't do those things. Uh, we have other people on staff who do do those things. We've had people go over ceilings. Um, we had somebody asked, uh, I had one of, my, one of my guys called me one time and said, is drywall fair game? That was his, or it was a text message, sorry. Is drywall fair game? And I'm like, I need to call him and make sure that we're on the same page here. Uh, <clears throat> the reality was is that there was a data center is, and it was, there was nothing but drywall between us and it was a pretty important data center uh, and he wanted to know should he try and cut through the drywall to get into the data center because he was sure that there was nothing there. Uh, I said, no, that wasn't in the scope of work. We'll note it and you know, go from there. <laughs> Thanks for asking. So. Hey, you missed yeah, yeah, oh yeah, they'll, they'll take ladders in and they'll go over ceilings. That's not a problem. That's not destructive. It's when I'm not going to make a hole in the wall, you know, that's pretty destructive. <laughs> How much uh, social media do you guys use? <laughs> uh, a ton. So we'll use people's Facebook pages. We'll research them, see what they like. You know, the whole idea is I need to make a connection with you as fast as possible. So if our kids go to the same school, or I can pretend that our kids go to the same school, if I can pretend that, hey, we're in you know, the same you know, social groups or the same, like, same sports teams or whatever, whatever I can to get you talking to, to form a bond, to form a relationship. So social media is a big part of that. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, Facebook, even MySpace is still, you know, there's still a lot of stuff out there on MySpace. Um, so any of those things are, are a huge plus for us. So you notice how to get like through RFID doors, but how would you go through a facility if it was a guard facility? Uh, same way we normally would. We tell the guard we lost our badge or that our badge isn't working and it looks just like their badge and <clears throat> they're like, oh, okay. Uh, or we clone a badge. So one of the other ways we do it is we follow people out to lunch, okay? And everybody walks around at lunch with their badges hanging off of them and I come stand right up next to you at lunch and you're talking to all your friends and I'm talking to all my friends and, I, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, pardon me. There you go, I just cloned your badge. Takes about eight seconds, okay? And once I clone your badge, as long as I get back before you, I'm in, okay? Even if I get back after you, I'm still probably in because most organizations don't have tight enough policies where they don't allow an ingress without an egress, 
Okay? Most of the time it's just we want to know if you're coming in. We don't care if you're already in or if somebody else is trying to come in as you again and you're not checking any egress, so I'm probably already in. Okay? <clears throat> the thing I, well, I'm worried about is in those organizations that do check egress or do check to make sure that that badge doesn't badge in twice without badging back out, uh, then I gotta be worried about being in the building when you're trying to get back in. I have a very, very limited amount of time probably before you get back, unless I know based on your day planner that you're at the doctor's office or you're taking a half day vacation. Then I got all day. Does that help? Uh, so you were talking about using the rubber duck, using the hacking bricks. Yes. Um, what other tools do you use? What are some of your favorite things to do with those? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you mean while we're on site? Yeah. Uh, um, so okay, so we've got. I mean, we've got you know vulnerability scanners. We've got uh, we use Burt Suite to you know if we're going to look at a, a web application from the inside versus the outside. Um, we've got, um, you know, all of the other, you know, just the Metasploits and, you know, the, you know, Nopix and, you know, all that good stuff. So, I mean, there, there's a ton of different things. We've got the, the badge readers. Um, we've got a, a Wi-Fi booster that we can boost a Wi-Fi signal for somebody sitting outside that they can uh, get some stuff outside. Because uh, a lot of times, like, for internal wireless, they'll turn the wireless really far down. So, like, even if you're walking around the perimeter of the building, on the inside, you won't get wireless access. So we can put a, a Wi-Fi booster, a signal booster in, it'll boost the signal and, and push it back out. So, yeah. yeah. In your uh, reconnaissance step, uh, do you use a lot of tools like Multego or something, or is it more kind of just freestyle? No, it's just freestyle. Uh, we look at it, I mean, there, there's a ton of different tools out there, but yeah. honestly, from a cost perspective and, and complexity perspective, it's not needed. We can get all the information we need from just plain up standard reconnaissance. When you're looking to add people to your team to do this stuff, what type of skills do they have? What type of skills do you look for? Sure. Uh, confidence. <clears throat> like I said, if I believe I'm supposed to be there, you're going to believe I'm supposed to be there, right? So if you're like, you know, standing there like sweating profusely and like look like you're about ready to, you know, barf, <laughs> uh, you're probably not a good social engineer. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking for people that, that are engaging, who uh, certainly have technical expertise, but they can communicate. Uh, that they are uh, personable, you know, that they have varied interests so that if somebody can, you know, somebody starts talking to them or stops them in the hallway, they can pick up just like that. Um, you know, if uh, one of the hardest things to do is to be able to think on the fly, right? Uh, you go in with what you think the floor plan is or where you think a specific office is or, you know, whatever happens to be, what your objective is going to be. And then all of a sudden that changes because, hey, they remodeled the, you know, a year ago and I don't have the, the, the right floor plan or um, people moved offices or whatever happens to be. So I have to be able to think on the fly or like I said, when that, when that uh, executive admin came into the, to the conference room, uh, you know, most people would have probably just freaked out and been like, whoa, and you know, tried to bolt. And we we're like, hey, let's just challenge her and say, get out. And she did. <laughs> so. Um, yes and no. So <clears throat> nobody forced that employee to take that home, right? So if we left it at the office, okay, and typically we'll leave that on company property, either in the building or just directly outside. Like we're not going to go like put it on their windshield or something like that, right? So uh, the intent was to try and get that to, to happen, right? <clears throat> now certainly what happens is that employee takes that home. You know, we can't be responsible for that. Uh, they, you know pick that up at work, okay? So theoretically that's work property, right? I mean, it's on company property at that point. So it's not theirs, they didn't own it, right? So if they were to, you know, from a legal perspective, if, if, I, if I were to take that, take it home and plug it in and then, you know, we get all this traffic and I get their passwords and all that sort of stuff, I'm guessing what you're asking is do I have any liability for that, right? Um, the reality is they stole work property, okay? because they didn't own it, they didn't turn it in, because it wasn't theirs, they didn't know whose it was. And so as soon as they did that, they take the responsibility for whatever's on that, right? And so I'm covered under the fact that we gave that to, you know, to that company. Now if I'm a hacker, then certainly, yeah, I have liability on that side as well, right? But obviously I'm a criminal, I really don't care where my liability is, but for me personally, you know, for, for integrity, 
we're covered under that because it was work property that they took outside of work. So we, that's our legal interpretation of that. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Hopefully this was informative. Uh, ways to contact me, follow us on social media, whatever. Uh, always happy to answer questions or uh, build out the network. So appreciate it. Thank you.